All right. We have people coming in to our first ASO at home event. Welcome. We'll get started shortly. My name is Darko Buterets. I'm the music director of our Asheville Symphony. I'm joined tonight with uh, uh, several of my colleagues from the Asheville Symphony, all principal players and leaders in the orchestra. And uh, we have a lovely time catching up on, on what we've been up to, what we've been doing, and what we're looking forward to. And also an opportunity for our guests, you at home, to ask questions about all things orchestra and give you a chance to go a little bit behind the scenes and see what it's like uh, to be in the hot seat in the principal chair in, in, in our ensemble. Um, so anyway, we're very grateful for you to be here uh, tonight. You know, um, typically uh, September 21st, the beginning of fall is a time also when orchestras get going uh, around the world. Of course, this year is somewhat different. Um, uh, the Asheville Symphony is planning to return to the stage in late winter in February um, and to have concerts hopefully with, uh, with audience. We'll, of course, play it by ear. We keep our musicians safe. We keep our audience safe. That's the number, number one thing on us. But I think one of the hardest things uh, for me to, to see what everybody's going through worldwide is that it really is one of the hardest things to deal with is that we don't have access to activities together as a community. And music is such a big part of that, not just classical music, any kind of music is such a big part of that. And I think uh, it's pretty much the first time in history since you know we emerged from the caves that you know we're not able to even bang our drums together in, in, in a place. And uh, uh, that's, that's been hard to deal with, but you know, I'm sure all of us have found different ways to deal with it. So we'll talk about that and uh, just have a chance to, to catch up. So we have about 30 uh, people already on the call. I'm going to get started by asking each of you to uh, introduce yourself. So let's start uh, with Alicia. Go ahead. Tell us who you are, what you do, a little bit about yourself. Uh, you said me, right, Darko? Yes. Yeah, OK, great. Hi, <laughs> I'm Alicia Chapman. I'm principal oboe in the symphony. And I've been with the symphony since about 1997 um, and principal oboe since about 2000. Um, I also teach, I'm the oboe professor at Appalachian State University. I play Baroque oboe with the North Carolina Baroque Orchestra and uh, have been on reset for the last seven months. <laughs> and um, we'll talk a lot more about that, I'm sure. I live yeah. in Boone, North Carolina. Well, it, it's wonderful to, to have you on the call. I, I really appreciate everyone's time here. Let's go to Lissy, uh, your next door neighbor in the orchestra. Hi, everybody. I'm Lissy Shanahan, and I live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, do a whole lot of uh, flute teaching, mostly out of my home. Um, have some adult students and most of our student, uh, I say our, my husband is also a flute player. And so we run our studio together. Most of our students are in uh, middle school and high school. And, um, and then I also teach at High Point University. Um, and, uh, and actually, uh, I feel kind of lucky to actually be able to play in the orchestra there this semester. Wow. Um, we're, we're not playing a whole lot, but a little bit. And we sit quite far apart and we even have specially made instrument masks. Uh, but it's been nice to, to stay on top of um, some ensemble playing. Um, and I've been with the Asheville Symphony since 2009. Wonderful. Jeffrey. Hi, I'm uh, Jeffrey Whaley and I play uh, principal French horn. Um, I live in Knoxville and actually my full-time playing job is principal in the Knoxville Symphony. So when you don't see me in Asheville um, on the unfortunate times that I have to miss a concert, it's usually because I'm playing a concert over in Knoxville. Um, I think I joined the orchestra in 2008 or 2009. I'm not entirely sure. So you're, you're cornering the mountain market, both sides of, of the continental divide. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Jason, our concert master. Hi everyone, great to see you all. Uh, Jason Posnock, concert master, uh, otherwise known as the, the guy who gets on stage last at the concerts. Well, except for Darko, of course. But uh, I'm here in Brevard, North Carolina. Uh, my day job is 
as the vice president and chief artistic officer of the Brevard Music Center. So even though we didn't have a season this past summer, we have been, uh, we have been finding ways to keep ourselves busy, to say the least. Yeah, that's a that's a common theme throughout is how how we stay connected to to our audiences uh, during this time. Daniel, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background. Hi, I'm Daniel Mum. I've been principal cello of the Asheville Symphony since 2016. Uh, I'm I live in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm also principal of the Augusta Symphony in Georgia and a member of the Virginia Symphony. And uh, these days I've just been basically a full-time babysitter. My, my wife and I had a, a, a baby, our son Keijo last year. So this has kind of been a blessing in disguise that I've, I've got to spend a lot of time with our baby that I would have been on, otherwise on the road or uh, you know, otherwise engaged. So it's, it's kind of been a mixed, mixed, mixed blessing. Beautiful. Well, congratulations. And again, welcome to all of you. Thank you for, for being here and giving your time uh, for this event. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's such a strange time um, to be making music. So uh, let's just go around, uh, jump in and tell me what are some ways that you have stayed musically active when we can't really stay musically active? Maybe start with Lissy because she mentioned uh, you're, you're still playing in an orchestra with very special circumstances. What's that like? Tell, so tell us what's going on. Broken the orchestra into pieces. So they're having, um, they're playing some string pieces and, um, and that's every other week. And then the opposite week we have wind rehearsals and they've actually even separated that out into woodwind section and um, and the brass section. So um, uh, we're, we're playing some really good music. Uh, the Petite Suite by Gounod is really uh -huh. fun. And then another piece that I found is called, um, it's a symphonietta by uh, a man named Raff. Um, and it reminds me of Raff. Actually, I'm really enjoying playing it. Yeah. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, uh, my husband and I have been called to play at a lot of church gigs since the very beginning of the pandemic, like since the second or third week. We've played um, lots and lots of church gigs, way more than we normally do. We've made lots of recordings for online services. Uh -huh. um, and then finally, uh, with our large studio that we run at the house, we do uh, several studio recitals each spring and we weren't able to do those. So we actually managed to do them online. I learned a lot about editing videos <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, put together over two hours worth of video recordings for our studio wow. recitals. So all of our students still got a chance to play. That's beautiful. You mentioned earlier that uh, you have special, as a flute player, you have special protection uh, for other um, players in the ensemble. You want to share a little about that? Or? Yeah, so uh, this is my flute mask. My mom made it for me. And um, it's, it's just like your regular old mask, except that it's, uh, it's a bit baggier so the flute can fit on the inside. And I just wrap it around my ears. It looks a bit like a beard. <laughs> uh, but there's Therefore, you have competition. Stick my flute through. <laughs> and, um, and then I also have a, a small piece of cloth that I rubber band onto the end because there's quite a bit of, um, of air that comes out the very end of the flute and I don't want that going to my neighbor. So um, I haven't gotten as far as putting a bag around the entire instrument yet, but hopefully it helps. I'm sure. Yeah, no, the, the, it's been very strange. What are the oboe and the horn, uh, what's that situation like? For, I mean, for the string players, we know, we, we can wear masks, we can still read. It's not comfortable necessarily, it's, it can be difficult, but from your end, have you played much in ensemble since the pandemic began? Have you had much experience with that? Actually, Alicia and I had the pleasure of playing just this past, um, I guess a couple days ago, um, over in Asheville for the Asheville Chamber Society. Uh -huh. uh, we played the Dvorak Wind Serenade um, and also the Mozart Grand Partita. Um, and Alicia sounded fabulous as always. That's such um, a but it was piece. it was great to get yeah. it was great to get together to see you know old faces we haven't seen each other in so long. And 
it was an outdoor concert. So we had, you know, plenty of spacing between us. The audience was socially distanced. Um, so it felt very safe. Um, as far as like the, the PPE for French horn players, I was gonna say, we do have, you? we have bell covers that we can put over our bell to, okay. to catch aerosols. But as we all know, the problem is that we have to put our hand inside the bell. And the most recent study from UC Boulder says that like when you cut a hole in the, in the bell cover and put your hand in, you actually concentrate any viral particles onto the hand. So it becomes a little extra dangerous to do that. And we have to be really careful to wash our hands if we're using those covers. Yeah. Um, so there's not a great solution for horn players. Have you done any indoor gigs at all uh, since this whole thing began? I don't, I have not, no. That's a little more challenging. You really have to have an incredibly large space and very good ventilation. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of incredible how it all works. What about from the oboe side, Alicia? Well, um, yes, that concert on Saturday was just so much fun. And for me, it was the first time in many months where I've been able to see how many, 13 people, I guess, 10 to 13 people all at once and make music, uh, incredible music together. And um, the spacing was well thought out. Um, you know, the horns facing back, and they were in the way back and then a row of bassoons and then clarinets and oboes on the side, we, we felt pretty good. Um, I have not done any indoor concerts during this time. I've done several outdoor concerts. Um, I have a friend who has a beautiful porch in Davidson, North Carolina, and about a half acre yard that is shaded by beautiful trees and gardens. And she's arranged some porch concerts and they've been really successful. It's the same idea as the yard concert um, that we just did, but people are just really hungry and so appreciative to hear live music and be in the presence of, um, you know, something happened, being created in the moment. Um, at school, we've also done a lot of research and study about the aerosols that go around. And while I am teaching 100% online this semester, um, uh, they, they are having ensembles, but they've wow. broken the orchestra, the wind ensemble, uh, symphony band, they've all broken down into groups of 10 to 15, one group has 22. But the rooms are big enough and they had to tape off the distance, uh, the proper distance to the side and forward and back for each person. And so they are rehearsing and, and, and making music, but the 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 PPE, the coverings are very challenging for the students. Um, for oboes, we, they, we have um, a mask that has a flap with a piece of Velcro. Okay. So when you're not playing, you attach the Velcro here. When you are up. playing, you attach <laughs> the Velcro here. And they, you know, it, it takes a while because, you know, they're hitting the mask with their reeds. And so they figured out how to place the reed in the mouth when they have to play. But you know, they are being such good sports about it. And I have to say the music students are being ultra responsible. Um, it's not necessarily the case campus wide. We, we have had some issues, but um, I'm happy that the music students are doing their part. I, you know, being involved with Tallahassee Symphony, Florida State University, big music school, I saw their suggested protocol and for oboes, it was told that they should use like a a pantyhose that's cut and put on the belt to prevent, is that a thing? Yeah, yeah, the, um, all the winds have bell coverings and basically it's pantyhose material. Right. And they also say um, people who have been making masks have put the pantyhose material as an extra lining inside the mask to help, you know, capture the aerosol particles and it has been helpful. Yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, that, that can also act as a mute <laughs> for oboes. <laughs> if you right. put a skinny hose up the bell, that's an old trick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's rare that that is needed. Well, yeah, it is rare. <laughs> but it's glad to know we have the, the option. Yeah. What about our string players? What have you guys been up to? Have you had a chance to make any music since this whole thing began? What has your experience been like? Well, Darko, we did a recording project back in early June, was it? 
Yeah. And that was uh, that was the largest group that I've been part of certainly since uh, since all of this. And it, I mean, that felt completely fine to me. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, it was just uh, team players. I, I should say for for people at home who who don't know necessarily what we're talking about. Back in June, we did a recording of George Walker's lyric for strings. George Walker is the first African-American composer to win a Pulitzer Prize, Prize in Music and was an incredible musician. Uh, I think one of the first uh, black pianists who performed with the Philadelphia Orchestra back in the 1950s. Yeah. Um, and uh, certainly uh, this piece has um, gotten quite a lot of performance in the last 10 years or so. And so we made a recording and uh, there's a music video to accompany it and that's gonna be coming out uh, in the next week or so, don't hold me to the exact date that's, that's in the hands of the office. But uh, I'm very, I'm really looking forward. That was a wonderful experience. And uh, for me, it was the first time to make live music since March. So it was, yeah. it, it was very, very special to, to have both of you there and to work on that piece. Um, Daniel, what about you? Have, has anything, has Charleston been active in, in, uh, in recent times? Have you been involved? Yeah, I actually um, have played a couple indoor orchestra live streams. Uh, both in Charleston and in Hilton Head uh -huh. as well. And um, in Hilton Head, uh, the, they decided to kind of reprogram one of their concerts with just spring repertoire. So that kind of um, solved a lot of the issues, uh, like we were saying before, where if you're, you're not blowing into to anything, you can, you can do um, masks and social distancing and, and still stay within all the guidelines. And then in Charleston, um, we actually did a, a full full orchestra concert, and they had everyone tested. They they have a partnership with MUSC, That's such uh, a the, uh, thing. the hospital in Charleston, so they have everyone tested a day or two before. And actually, there were a couple people who um, who were not there <laughs> at the concert. Um, it, it, you know, might have just been false positives, but but. Uh, I could take a chance. Yeah, so they had to they had to kind of scramble and figure out what to do about that, who could cover what parts, or if they could get someone someone else in. But um, I think that's that's going to be the uh, the the way things are going forward here in Charleston. That they're going to have everyone um, tested before before each concert. Yeah, I should mention to uh, our uh, audience at home if uh, one of the main reasons that we're still not performing is that in North Carolina, of course, we have a limit to 50 people in terms of uh, a gathering. And that, of course, restricts things. Personally, I'm very much in favor of that. I'm not in favor of large orchestral gatherings. It's hard not to make music, but they will come. And we will make music, and it will be really special when we do. But um, I would hate to, to see our hall become any kind of vector in, in this pandemic. And uh, I'm very grateful for the way uh, the Asheville Symphony has approached this. And, uh, very much looking forward to the spring and uh, finding ways for us to come back together as a group. I know it'll be very special. I had, uh, I, I'm curious, I'll share just one, one thing on the, on, the, on the subject we talked about. I, I had uh, performances in uh, recordings in Amarillo and in Tallahassee in the last two weeks. And the thing I found most distressing was how much more difficult the chamber music making quality of orchestra playing is when everybody's distance. I don't know, have you faced that? Is it, it must be much harder just to, even in a, in a non-et or, a, or a, you know, a sextet to, to, when you're so far apart, not to be able to really hear each other well, especially in an outdoor setting. Tell me, any experiences like that? Yes, well, I'll just say on Saturday when we were we were spaced out a little more than we normally would have been, but um, and that is challenging for hearing, but it does it sharpens your senses too in a way. You you listen in a different way, and also the communication, your body language also um, is magnified just a little bit. And yeah. I, I, it was quite a nice feeling of connection, didn't you think so, Jeffrey? Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, being in the horn section, we're normally in the very back of the orchestra, and then we have the disadvantage of pointing backwards and also bouncing off of who knows what is behind us. Um, so we always have a, a sort of a delay that we're trying to anticipate and, and compensate for. 
So I think horn players generally, like we're, we're a little bit more aware of that. Um, but I, in some of the outdoor concerts that I've played where we've been socially distanced, you know, I'm used to having a horn player beside me just a couple of feet minimum or maximum. And to have someone six feet away, like we sound totally different. So it's quite a challenging to, to play together and create a cohesive section sound when it's that far spread. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's uh, it. Making music in this fashion makes me appreciate how much, you know, the real thing is. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I suppose on a, on a, let's say on a, on a different note, um, uh, what are some things that maybe apart from music that you use this time for? Is there anything outside of music that this sudden free time for artists that we have that you took advantage of and maybe a new hobby or something like that since we're pretty much stuck at home? I learned how to do poor art. I made some art for my house. <laughs> poor art fun um wow. and uh yes yeah, so you just take a bunch of different colors of acrylic paint and you layer it in a cup and then you you know scramble it however you'd like over a canvas and then pour it until it rolls over the edges um so that's been uh gonna show us uh, uh an example go get one yeah go get one come back yeah what else guys well, I spent the, the first part of the pandemic, I think like a lot of people, trying to make things feel just as normal as possible. And then I went through the phase of like sourdough bread making that most people <laughs> did, that we saw on Facebook. And then, then I went through the phase of watching Tiger King and binging everything on, on, or on Netflix. And then like more recently, it's almost been like staring into the abyss. Like what's, what's the next project? I've been gardening i'm a beekeeper so i've been playing with my bees and wow. i've got I'm, I'm a bit of a uh, I, I like hobbies so i have a lot of little tiny hobbies that have kept me busy um but it hasn't really taken the place of making music so you need to bring us some honey so we can try at, at our next and our reunion concert consider it done yeah <laughs> wonderful alicia you were going to say something what, what have you been up to um i um well just the hobbies, it's just been a real, what I meant by reset, when I said that in the beginning, it's my goodness, you have to look at everything in such a different way now. And um, there've been a lot of positives. Uh, like I get to clean my house once in a while. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but for hobbies, it, you know, I have to, t I've taken some acrylic art painting classes and a watercolor class coming up and wow, wow who, who would have thought it? to Fantastic. take the time to do that. It's been a real well filler. And that's how I think of it. It's just filling up the well with things that haven't really, haven't had time for before, so. Sure. Uh, looks like we have the artist, the artist is back. <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you. Wow. That is fabulous, yeah. They all have similar colors, but very different patterns. Neat. I never heard of it before. What about my string playing gentlemen? What personal activities, hobbies, cooking? Well, Daniel, you certainly had uh, a built-in uh, a built-in job waiting for you. Oh yeah, and uh, and then my wife and I also bought a house too, so it was oh. just there's wow. been very, very little time for for hobbies and and. I've painted so many walls, I never want to see another paintbrush again in my life. <laughs> I got to spend a lot more time with my kids, you know, since we were all st stuck together in the house. Uh, luckily, it turns out we like each other. So that's, uh, that was a lot of fun to just uh, actually just be together. The four of us spent a lot of time. We played uh, a lot of board games. A, uh, we had a, a family galactic ticket to ride championship which is a fun board game uh so that kind of took us through the summer the train game right right yeah exactly we have about eight or nine different boards so nice yeah. so lovely. that was fine lovely and now they're back in school so now it feels strange uh to be in the house and they're not right that could have both its positives and negatives it's been positive. <laughs> no, it's great to have them back in school. It's where they belong yeah. and they are happy. And luckily they go to school at a Montessori school down here in Brevard uh, called Mountain Sun Community School. 
that just happens to be on the campus of Brevard Music Center. So it's uh, an ideal situation for them. Wonderful. Well, I have some questions from our audience. And uh, for the audience members, uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button. You can click on that and you're welcome to submit questions. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, just go through a couple. Uh, John Condren asks, and I actually, I was going to ask this, piece, this question next, so it's fantastic. Um, what's the one piece of music that the ASO has yet to play that you'd like to see when we get back to business? Hmm. Let's start with, let's start with Daniel. Let's go the, the opposite way. We'll go the other way around. Uh, um, that I would like to see or that I'm excited about coming up on the... the that you would like to see, that like we have not played yet, what would you love to play? Um, well, let's see. I, I played Sibelius' Fifth Symphony um, last time for, for, for last year for the first time and I was unfamiliar with that piece and wow I just uh, that's one of my new favorites I would really love to play that again um, I think just yeah, a second that, that choice it's a great great horn work awesome oh yeah awesome Jason well you know I I don't remember the last time we were. Were we supposed to play Beethoven Seven, Darko? We were. That was yeah. in April, right before. Everything. So, yeah. you know, I have to admit, when, when getting back into orchestra, kind of go to. I want to play what feels good to play, right? You just want to sort of get in there and and you know, for me, that's Beethoven and Brahms. I have to say. Yeah. And so, Beethoven Seven would be great. Brahms Four. Do we have any Brahms on the schedule? Uh, we do. Uh, currently in February, we're supposed to open with Brahms 1. Brahm, uh, that'll do. But, you know, um, I, I agree. I, I think uh, my favorite quote from my undergrad was the, the conductor of the orchestra. I don't know if one of the kids was complaining about doing Brahms or was not doing it very well and, you know, he was a guy trained in Austria and he, he just had a great uh, answer. Like, Brahms is your life. <laughs> and in some ways, Brahms is our life. I think it's, it's uh, uh, at least as music director, I, I love programming it. It's hard, it's challenging. Uh, you have to earn that piece, no matter which of the symphonies or even you know the overtures, Haydn variations, the concertos, you have to work on the piece heavily because it's the orchestrations are are rich and heavy it's the ears everybody's ears just have to be like little radars and the music is not um driven by pulse but is more driven by phrase and so it really takes an orchestra breathing together listening together to make it come up and have the let's say the schwung that's necessary and i agree with you i i think it's fantastic stuff and i look forward to doing it uh, in the future, absolutely. Jeffrey, what's your, your wish? I'm, I'm sure the symphony has done it, but I know that I've never played it with the Asheville Symphony, and that would be Mendelssohn IV. Um, for me, that's, that's my all-time favorite orchestral piece. So oh, um, I always get a lot of joy from seeing that one programmed. And I think the music, it just, it just drips of happiness from it's beginning cool. to end, uh, just truly gorgeous. And if I could be indulgent and pick two, I would ask for the Bartok Miraculous Mandarin. Because it just it doesn't get programmed enough and it's really evocative and fun yes. to play. Because it's about the hardest piece in the repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not easy to put together. And uh, uh, as you said, you know, audiences don't know it. It's, it's kind of a, a hard thing to sell. But for our audiences at home, if you don't know, Sibelius Fifth Symphony, beautiful work, discover yeah. it. Um, uh, Miraculous Mandarin, absolutely. And yeah, no, I, I, uh, the Italian, uh, Italian Symphony Mendelssohn is, uh, is a gorgeous work. Yeah, the first movement then, your favorite or what? Of the Italian Symphony? Yeah. Oh, definitely the first movement. First movement. Yeah, it's true, it's like- it's But it's all good. There's it's not good. a bad note in the entire symphony. Totally agree. And Daniel, now I have to go and listen to Sibelius Five. Sibelius Five feels like, for the the first two thirds of the piece, it feels like 
a flower opening up. It doesn't have edges, it just like organically grows. And then when the last moment arrives, you know, the horns have the big moment and it's just, it's glorious. And it's strange because if you, at least from my perspective, I look at the material, it seems very simple. You know, it's just cords in the horn. It, but the way he psychologically prepares you for the arrival, for the golden arrival, I mean, it's like, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Kind of same recipe from the second symphony of Sibelius, but even more subtly done. I guess I would put it that way. Alicia, what about you? Unmute. Um, oh, Sibelius, uh, absolutely. I have about 10 that came to mind, <laughs> 10 pieces <laughs> that came to mind, so I'm trying to go through them. Um, uh, you, you know, Mo Mozart 29, Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, um, Schubert 7. Uh, <laughs> but I have to Wait, say... Which, Schubert 7, the great or... No, the other one. The unfinished? Oh, wait a second. Yes, it's Schubert Ninth. That's what it is. Yes. No, but right. you're right. It is actually Schubert Seventh. It is Seven. That's what, yeah, exactly. Numbering, exactly. For the people at home, the numbering of Schubert's symphonies is a complete mess because, well, the guy was a little bit of a complete mess, the way everything was published and discovered. But so the Great Symphony, the C major Great Symphony. Yes, the Great yes. Symphony. I believe the cellists and the violinists below are not very happy about that choice because they don't stop playing for like 60 minutes straight. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's an hour, it's a chop buster too. <laughs> but well, anyway, I, I will wrap that up by saying I would just love to see the Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances programmed. Um, and if I get to play Sibelius second 10 more times, I won't complain. Yeah. <laughs> great choices, all great choices. Lizzie, what about you? So mine was also actually Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. I uh -huh. To play it. I fell in love with it the first time I ever heard it in college and um, I was supposed to play it this fall in the Winston-Salem Symphony but it was canceled so there goes that opportunity. Hopefully there will be another. We'll find another. Um, okay so question for you because I'm fairly new to Asheville. You guys have been around longer. I heard a story regarding Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra um, regarding the third movement specifically. It's the, it's the movement of night music and as, as most people know Bartok did spend time in Asheville, uh, recovering, uh, taking the air, and uh, you know uh, he was ill, so he, he came down and, and uh, stayed at the Albemarle um, uh, bed and breakfast. And um, the story I heard, it was from David Zinman, was that the repeated piccolo C's in the third movement were inspired by a rusty swing that was outside of the window and was just going like. And so it repeats at this pitch over and over and over and over again. I don't know. Does that ring a bell? Is that just urban legend? I've never heard that before, but as a piccolo player, I can say that must be an awfully annoying squeak. <laughs> squeaky, squeaky swing. Well, um, all great choices. Let's see. We have uh, one more question. Uh, oh, Carol asked uh, for Jason. Carol McCollum asks, are your children keeping up with the drums and the violin? <laughs> Jason so, says play uh, percussion and, and violin, right? Right. Well, my my daughter has made a very recent switch to piano from violin, so it's nice wow. to hear the piano being played in the house, which is great. Um, so we'll see how long that lasts. If uh, she wants to come back to violin, that's fine, and if not, I'm glad she's studying uh, a real instrument. Uh, sorry, everyone. Anyway, uh, <laughs> no, I'm glad she's, she's doing something seriously. Uh, Max is still, uh, doing percussion lessons. He takes a Zoom lesson, uh, once a week with the principal of the Louisiana Philharmonic. So every Saturday we take him over to the percussion room at the Brevard Music Center and he logs on and has a Zoom lesson, so. Beautiful. Great. Beautiful. I know he misses orchestra. He wishes that uh, that youth orchestra were back in session, but hopefully soon. Hopefully soon, exactly. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask before, I, I'm gonna go back to reader questions as well, I'm, I'm, just to mix it up a little bit. Um, for the listeners at home, you're all principals of your section. 
and every section is different. So describe for somebody who is new to classical music, who is new to the orchestra, what is it you do in your position that's different than what would be normally expected of a person who's just playing, let's say, the flute, the oboe, the violin, horn, cello, etc. Let's start with listen. Um, well, it's, it's a very different experience to play principal than it is to play, um, say, second flute. Um, How is that? Is it because of the solos or is there more to it? Um, well, it, yes, the solos definitely have something to, to do with it. Um, uh, the solos, of course, put you on the spot more, and so it, it can be uh, quite a bit more stressful. But it also changes um, who you have to listen to in a more close, in a, in a more specific way. So, um, like, when I'm playing principal, uh, of course, I'm sitting right next to Alicia, and I'm constantly working on making my sound blend with her and making sure that we are as in tune as we can be and linking into... Um, into the other uh, principal wind players as well. When I'm playing second flute, um, then I'm doing everything that I can to make the first flute player sound really good. Um, right. Making my sound blend with theirs and making sure that I'm anticipating everything they do as well as I can. So not only then watching um, the conductor, but as a second flute player, I'm also actually watching uh, the end of the flute uh, to my left um, to make sure that I play exactly with with them. Um, so it's it's a very different experience to play in different um, in different sections. And playing piccolo, I would say, is much more like playing principal. Right. The part is the function of the part is completely different. Yes. Yeah. Alicia, what about you? Mm. Um, being in an oboe section is so interesting because there, there's such a, a richness of overtones that come from a, a double reed instrument that is wonderful and challenging. And um, uh, oboists in a section, we tend to talk about reeds a lot and uh, we try to, no one makes duplicate reads, you know, we all make our reads in a slightly different way because we all resonate. We should say every player makes their own reads and every read that player makes is inherently different. Um, depending on yeah. numerous factors. Yeah, every read that I make, one to the next is slightly different. That, that so, piece. In other yeah. words, as a principal player, you're bringing the instrument to your mouth. If the read is new at rehearsal, you're trying it out for the first time, you kind of don't really, you don't have a full idea of how it's gonna, going to respond. It's like a, a, a leap of faith in a way. That's right. It, you know, after years and years of making reads, you can kind of, you can guesstimate this read is going to sound like this when I play the first note in the orchestra. And you, you can get good at that. Right. Um, but uh, conditions in the hall, the humidity, the temperature, so many things have an effect on uh, double reads. So things change very quickly. And the more you play on a double read, um, uh, what I say to my students is I can get two rehearsals in one concert generally out of a read and then it's just done. And that's on a good day. Um, some, I use a different read for every rehearsal and hopefully we'll choose the best one for the concert. You don't want to play on your read day after day after day because it does break down. Right. So you have to pace yourself and the second oboist has to do the same and the English horn player has to do the same and we all have to kind of meet in the middle while we're doing that. It's, it's challenging and um, uh, but very satisfying. Uh, playing principal oboe, you are playing in the upper range a lot of the time. So your read requirements are slightly different than playing second oboe who will generally be in the first octave, and not, not always, but that's where their support lies. And our ability to blend is so important. Um, and when we do, it's just, it's magic. I, I, I find it fascinating and I happen to have a wonderful oboe section, uh, couldn't be better in the Asheville Symphony. And I'll just say one really beautiful little story. It was about um, maybe 10, 12 years ago when Cara Jenkins first came to the orchestra and we were both looking for new that oboe. That is our second oboe. The, the, the second oboist, Ms. Cara Jenkins, um, 
we were both looking for oboes at the same time. And so we ordered together eight oboes and we tried wow. them and we got the best combination that we thought and the oboe we liked the best. And at the end of it all, we thought for sure we were both going to choose the same instrument, that we would both want the same instrument. But in fact, it was just the opposite. I, uh, we each got the one we wanted and we were able to play for about eight years on this matched pair that was just spectacular. And then my oboe cracked and her oboe cracked and we had to get new oboes. But it was a, it was a really interesting experience to try to do that in a section. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but just a neat thing for people to notice at home is the longevity of instruments is actually quite different in the orchestra. Um, string players can have an instrument if it's maintained and updated, but the instrument can be hundreds of years old, literally, whereas when instruments are, for example, reeds, they deteriorate so much quicker because of the nature of, of the playing, um, which also then the economics of playing instruments is quite different. Uh, Entry-level string instruments uh, can be quite difficult to obtain because they're so expensive as a result. But anyway, I digress. Jeffrey, uh, you're up to bat. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It's been ages. Your roles and responsibilities as a principal player. What, what, is, what is it like being principal horn? How is that different from something else, being just a, another horn player in the orchestra? And what does it feel like? So one thing that wasn't mentioned, um, but I think that um, both of the wind players uh, would agree is that like the wind sections, we each have individual parts. Um, so in, in a slight way, like the entire horn section is, is, is made up of four principles. We each have a very distinct role. We each have you know, certain expectations. So the principal horn kind of has to be the principal principle and really, um, communicate extremely directly um, as far as what musical interpretations. Um, I, I feel like as the principal, I have to be the most receptive from what the conductor is providing. And then also very receptive to what the other principals are providing and find a way to translate that to the people sitting to my right to make sure that we're all working cohesively. Um, I find it like super rewarding. It's, it's one of the most fun things, just the collaboration, um, knowing that like I'm communicating with principals on all sides of the stage. Um, it's just, it's super, it's super fun, but it is a, an added layer of pressure on top of, you know, the occasional solo. Well, horn solos are, are notorious. You play, you played probably the most high rope in instrument in the orchestra, right? It, tell people about that. I mean, well, I'm sitting between an oboe and a flute on this chat. So I don't think I have much room to talk about solos. Uh, but it is true. Um, I know my teachers always told me that it's like a high wire act um, to, to play the French horn to be able to come in and, you know, we're almost like, like stepping off of a cliff. Like once you make the step, you're going down and you hope <laughs> to hit the right notes on the way. Um, <laughs> But there's no, like, there's no take backs with, with right. really any brass instrument. And the French horn is just a little less forgiving. Um, but since you mentioned the, the story about Brahms, how it's live, I'll yes. tell you that um, I was learning Brahms too when I was in school. And you know, it's just got the most glorious horn parts. And I remember my teacher after a couple of lessons on this music, I, I guess I wasn't like leaning in enough. I wasn't really embracing the music. And he was like, Jeffrey, do you realize this is the most fun you can have with your clothes on. And for a horn player, that is entirely true. Like Brahms is, is so much fun. And I enjoy playing principal, really playing any part on that. Uh, you guys perform Brahms too, I believe, during the search here. Is that, if I remember correctly? Yeah. It's a bummer. It's one of my favorites. I, I love that piece. It's just, it's perfect. It's perfect. You, you said earlier, you know, how in Mendelssohn there is not a note missing. Brahms 2 is the same way. From, yeah. From the same way. All right. Uh, let's save the concertmaster for last. We're going to go to the principal cellist. First, Daniel, tell us about being the leader of the cello section. Well, um, I mean, for, for us string players, we have a lot of the same considerations as far as, um, you know, ensemble playing, but a big part of our job description is also bowings and making sure that our bowings within the section are coordinated and that they're coordinated with the other string sections. So that 
that um, usually takes up a lot of uh, attention. Right. Let me just, uh, for people at home, um, bowings are the direction that the bows are moving in the orchestra in the section. Um, the direction of the bow um, really can dictate phrasing, articulation, dynamics. All parameters of music are dependent on which way the bow moves. Now, we're trained to be able to do everything, whether it's going up or it's going down, but um, that element is so crucial to the cohesiveness of the string sound. And so, as you mentioned, you're responsible for the cello bowings, but at the same time, you're also trying to fit in uh, with the violas, with the violins, and with the bass behind you, right? Yes, that's right. And then I try to, um, I try to save as many copies of pieces that I've played, or I have a whole Google Drive full of, um, you know, old PDF copies. So if I need to make any executive decisions about Boeing's, I can just pull it up on my phone and say, okay, last time I did this. Um, and that's another thing that, that I think the section, players in the section are usually appreciative when, when you can be decisive about those things and not waffle and say, oh, you know, I know I changed it. I changed this Boeing, but we're going to change it back. And um, so it's, it's, that's been helpful to have, have some reference copies as far as Boeing's. And then um, also just as far as playing goes, I find that um, I have to be maybe a more demonstrative than I would if I was just playing solo music or playing with a, you know, pianist. There's a lot of um, like pizzicato that you do maybe more dramatic or um, just more demonstrative so that players who are sitting, you know, 20, 30 feet behind you can, can have some kind of visual cue to, to latch on to. I think, yeah. That, that's uh, so, uh, on that note, uh, just one funny story of music in the time of COVID. The last concert in Tallahassee, uh, the stage manager set up the orchestra in, a, in the traditional way, which is we would have eight players around the conductor's podium. But if you take eight players at six feet around the conductor's podium, <laughs> there's a giant arc, and the cellist and the concert master were, I don't know, like basically from you know, the one in the cello section to the end of the first violins, it was ridiculous. And uh, they were saying, you know, well, we can't do anything, but I can see where he puts his finger. <laughs> and that's how we tried to stay together. I mean, it, it, was, it was very, very challenging. So if we do end up doing, you know, if, if we're not able to play normally in the spring and we do have to social distance, we'll, we will change our seating to be four in the semicircle and then eight and then a 16, not... Mm. Uh, everything socially distanced. But um, we saved the concert master for last, of course, such an important position in the orchestra. Tell us, Jason, what is it like from, from your end? Well, I think that the number one thing I think about is translating your physical motion into information for my section, primarily the first violins, also the second violins, also the rest of the strings and, you know, pretty much anyone who's uh, looking at me. But that, that is my number one job, I believe, is, is, a, is a translator. And then, you know, as Danny was saying, being demonstrative, moving in a way that will encourage my colleagues to play together. So depending on the music, that may be a very small motion or it may be a very big motion. Um, it's very different when I, I've had a lot of my life sitting in the backs of violin sections, and, and that's a very different and frankly more difficult thing to do than sitting uh, closer to the front. Um, Why is that? You, what's that? Why is that? Well, you, you actually got to anticipate a little bit. So you have to be able to, you know, if you wait until you hear the concertmaster play, you're going to be behind, but you don't want to be in front of the concertmaster because uh, no concertmaster likes that. So it, it is definitely having to, uh, to know the music well, being able to listen. You talked about chamber music in an orchestra and, you know, not only are you having to listen to those around you to give a section sound, but you're listening to the violas, you're listening, don't tell the violas I said that, but you're listening <laughs> to the cellos, let's say. You're listening to the wind players 
and we all know the horns always win. So you have to listen to the horns. So it's, uh, <laughs> tell me I'm wrong, Jeffrey. <laughs> Uh, I think you cut out for a second. I didn't hear that. <laughs> I was going through a tunnel. I'm sorry. Uh, so there's a, I mean, what, for me, one of the really fun parts is just eye contact with all of my colleagues. I'm looking at Daniel all the time. I'm looking at the principals. I'm looking at the wind. And, and in some cases, when I can see them, the brass players, uh, I mean, I know they're, they're looking at me and there's developing that timing and every hall is different. So the Asheville, where, where we play in Asheville is very different from where Jeffrey plays uh, in Knoxville is from different from where Darko conducts in Tallahassee. So we're keeping all of these variables in play at all times. Yeah, it's I, don't think, I don't think Jason has given himself enough credit. Um, and I just wanna say like from the person who's sitting in the back row of the orchestra, we're all, you know, we're getting information from the conductor, like that's pretty obvious, um, but we're also getting a great deal of information from the concert master. And working with different concert masters, like I can tell you that Jason in particular is extremely keyed in to what's happening behind him. And he does check in very frequently with the winds and the brass. But it can be as simple as, you know, how, how aggressively are we gonna articulate? You know, we can see that by his bow stroke. Or, you know, when we're holding a really long note and we need to know just the right instant to release the note, we can see when the bow lifts. So we get a lot of visual information from the concert master, even though the conductor, you know, is a little bit more visible. We, we, it's kind of a, they work in tandem. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, That's no. why I have to sit on that phone book, Jeffrey, so you can see me. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I hope uh, in some near future we'll we'll uh, we'll have a new performing space where we'll we'll have better sidelines and most importantly uh, better acoustics. I had a very interesting experience. I, I um, at this recording last week. Um, it I think I, I think Lucy mentioned how they split up the winds, the brass, and the strings uh, in orchestra. The, the orchestra did the same thing. They did a you know, they did a, actually did the, the Grand Partita and they did a Ways and Peace, a symphony in brass, and there, there was Tchaikovsky's Serenade for Strings. And because 18 brass musicians had to be spaced at X feet, I don't know, 10 feet or something like that, it was a huge arc that went all the way from the front of the auditorium, which is above the opera pit, all the way to the back. Mm. And in Ways and this piece is fairly rhythmical. It's not too hard to stay together. It's hard to listen at the distance, but still, you know, like, is easy. Tchaikovsky, certainly for strings, is like bubblegum. And it's hard. There's a lot of intricate, delicate passages that, that have to be played together. And it's tricky in, in so many ways. People coming off of notes together to start the passage has to be absolutely tight. And what happened, because of the setup, they set up the conductor podium where the brass front was. So because the podium was there, they put the strings on the opera pit, which was in the hall, meaning there was no shelf above the strings. Mm. And the first rehearsal, you get there and it is, it's like swimming in the dark without moonlight. <laughs> no, nobody can hear. I, I, I can hear the, the concert master principal cellist, that's it, like nobody else behind. Second rehearsal, we push everybody back into the shell and all of a sudden it's like color comes on the TV. Mm. Unbelievable experience. So I hope sometime in the near future, we as the orchestra have a chance to perform in a better acoustic for our audience, because really, um, I think uh, it was Mark Hotfelter, our principal trumpet, who quipped that we're the loudest orchestra that nobody hears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounds like Mark. For, for people at home, our musicians, you can, I mean, please share, so it's not just me saying, like, you have to give way more in Thomas Wilf to be heard. The energy required is far greater than in a hall where you could let the hall work for you, right? I think one of the other things about that space, Darko, if I may say, is we have no sense of what it sounds like. No, I don't Out of the audience. I have no idea. Poster, right? Yeah. Yeah, no chance. Uh, but one day, one day. Um, 
we have a few minutes left. Um, if there's any more questions, I encourage you uh, uh, to ask. There's one from Linda asking um, about, we've heard every, everyone on the panel, what they've been doing, what have I been doing? Um, I went to uh, Serbia to spend time with my family for a couple months. I'm back now in the US and um, I have a virtual season in Tallahassee with small uh, number of musicians, 10, 12 musicians uh, per concert. And we're working on that down there. Um, and of course, um, we started this ASO at home and we'll be continuing this uh, in future weeks. There are some great panels available. And I hope if you, if you found this enjoyable, that you'll return uh, to us in following weeks and tell your friends, grab a glass of wine and, and join us. Um, I'm gonna do a little lightning round with just some fun questions. So I'm gonna go, again, I'm gonna go in score. So it'll be uh, Lissy, Alicia, Jeffrey, uh, Jason, and Daniel. That, so um, just fun things. Um, finish this sentence for me. I would love to travel to... Uh, uh, South America. Excellent. Oh, Alicia. it's the same one for everybody. Yes. Um, Scotland. Scotland, Jeffrey. Unmute. I'm actually going to stay, stay in the States and say Miami. It's kind nice. of my happy place, and I try to get down there just every second that I get. Excellent. Jason? I'm going to give two answers, Darko. One is India, because I just miss being there with, uh, with Dilshad's family, and we couldn't go this year. But that's a place I've been, and a place I haven't been is uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, cool. And Daniel? Uh, Japan. Japan. All right, one more. Cats or dogs? Cats, because they take care of themselves. The dogs. <laughs> Definitely dogs. People. Ah, cop out. <laughs> <laughs> Other people's dogs. Other people's dogs. Good, good. It dogs for me, definitely. Dogs. Okay. Um, favorite Asheville haunt? Uh, <laughs> I think I spend most of the time there practicing and sleeping. <laughs> I'm not Is sure. Thomas Wolf? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fine art movie theater. Fine art movie theater, okay. Wonderful. I'm embarrassed that I haven't actually, I mean, I would, when we, when I first moved back to, to this region before playing in the Asheville Symphony, Jerusalem Cafe was probably one of my favorite places to eat in, in the city. I haven't been recently, um, so maybe that would be my choice. Okay. Guy Pani. Guy Pani. <laughs> Oh, I love fly fishing, and so usually every um, every concert day we have our morning dress rehearsal, and then there's enough time for me to get out and do some fishing off the Blue Ridge Parkway, and then I can change in my tuxedo on the parkway and then <laughs> hop back to town for the concert. Fantastic. And uh, all right, a couple more uh, favorite artists you would like to collaborate with the orchestra. It doesn't have to be a classical artist. I don't like this. I always have to go first. I don't have as much time. <laughs> 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 well, really, there are so many. Um, uh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll say that one of my favorite people that I've played with um, in the Asheville Symphony was Su Vin Kim. I would love to see him again. Awesome. Oh my gosh, there's so many artists. <laughs> um, but I, I'll just have to say what came to my mind. I recently saw Paige Whitley Bogus, Baroque dancer, do a performance online. It's spectacular. And I could just envision us with very atmospheric lighting, masked Baroque dancer playing early music behind her. Wow. So I would probably say Bernadette Peters. Ah. Um, we had a Pops show scheduled in Knoxville this season. And that was the one show I was the most excited about. And of course, had to be canceled. Um, so I'm, I'm a little heartbroken. Um, hopefully, I'll get to play with her sometime She's incredible. Soon. She's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Ah, hi. Well, one of my favorite violinists right now is Vilde Frong. So I'll say Vilde Frong. OK. 
Oh, well, I, I think I have to say yo-yo. You know, they in Charleston, when they opened up the new hall here, they were able to get him to come and play for the inaugural concert. So maybe, you know, who knows when, when they open up the new hall in Asheville, we maybe could sw swing that as well. <laughs> Even if we go. Uh, no, it would be fantastic to work with him. Well, um, I just want to thank everybody for their time. Um, I hope I got to everybody's questions. Um, and I look forward to doing this uh, again in, in the coming weeks. We'll have different themes. There's going to be, I think there's a wind players uh, Zoom. There's going to be a, a bro clover Zoom. So keep, keep your eyes open um, and stay connected with the Asheville Symphony. Uh, also, another thing to, to notice is we, uh, we're starting the new series, Splendor in the, in the Grass, which is an opportunity to have small ensembles or even one person from the Asheville Symphony serenade uh, locally. And you can find more information uh, about that on AshevilleSymphony.org. So we're not able to gather in large groups, but we are committed to staying present and look forward to being connected with you in, in coming weeks. Everybody, I miss you so much. I really, I can't wait. Uh, it's gonna be such a special time when we're gathered together again, and are able to make music in person. I, I hope you, you stay safe, um, and I look forward to, to staying in touch uh, throughout the fall. Good to see you. Thanks, Erica. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank well, everybody. Hi, Thank all. Thank you, everybody. Bye.